Hello. Y'all have a good Shabbat? So I went to get some hot tea for my boys because it's horse. And I thought, surely they won't start without us. <laughs> Me and Cole are getting some tea. And we heard, doo doo. And we're like, whoops, we better run. <laughs> so give me just a second while I grab my guitar. Is that all right? Oh, have you all had a good weekend? Yeah? I think I believe you. Sounds like it. All right. Well, we got one more time, so let's do this together and make it count, all right? All right. like him, a lion and the lamb, seated on the throne. Mountains bow down, every ocean roars, 
to the Lord of hosts. Praise Adonai, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Thank you. 
One last song, <clears throat> and I don't think you've ever heard it before. Do you believe me when I say that? But we can't have a conference without this song. Who already knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> all right, we'll see if you're right, all right?
Amen. And it's not Bill Clowder riding on. It's his Clowder riding on. It doesn't say riding on Bill Clowder. It says riding on Bill Clowder. I do want to make an announcement about the offering. This, this morning, when uh, people went in to make a donation on the website, HebraicRootsNetwork.com, it crashed the server. So it's back up. So if you want it, if you tried to make a donation and didn't get to do it, you can still go in and do it at HebraicRootsNetwork.com. And if you weren't able or here this morning to give and you had prepared an offering, uh, you may bring it to registration. Uh, this af after it's over with. So now we're getting ready for the last da dance presentation. We call them presentations rather than performances because they're presents for our King. Amen. It's an offering to Him. So if the dancers will come on up, they're going to do one called The Great I Am. And it's a very, very powerful song. And if there's anything in your life that you want him to defeat and to overcome, this is a song to let it go in because it is a very, very powerful song. This is King's Dance Ministry, and I think there's a plus one dancing with them as well. Let's worship.
Full, wasn't it? It's amazing what can be demonstrated in the, in the dance. Warfare, really, and praise, all in the same dance. All right, here she comes, Halisa, pulling up the rear. She's the rear guard. With all the tribal talk we've had this week, this is gonna be a powwow tonight. <laughs> Y'all may be seated. Anyway, yeah, she, she knows what tribe she's she pulling out last. That's the way it is. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. That's why I'm, we're bookends, me and Bill bookends. Anyway, what we wanted to do in this service here, in this portion, was that not awesome? You know, the worship and praise, and there again, these young kids up there, the kids are growing up. They used to be really kids, you know, and now they're growing up to young adults. Huh? Which grandson was that on this end? Sawyer. What? Sawyer. That was Sawyer, yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's right. Remember him when he was in a stroller? That's right. He, yeah. I don't want to embarrass him, but that's about the prettiest baby I've ever seen in my yeah, life. that's right. That's right, amen. Yes, until Brielle was born, that's right. <laughs> there you go, you got grandpas on each end here. So you'll see a tribal fight before long. But anyway, no, but really, truly. No, that, that's good. I do want to say this though before the camera people, the people running the sound, I want you guys to give them a big hand. Amen. Give them a shout. Amen. That is not easy to do, to sit there and be still and not shake. I am fidgety. If, if I was there, I would have to have a gyro on that camera <laughs> to keep it. Or, or people watching would be seasick. They'd be watching with Dramamine. But I'm just saying it is not easy uh, what they're doing. So I do just so appreciate all that they do and, and just the ministry that they have. So anyway, what we wanted to do tonight is, is in this portion tomorrow, uh, there's going to be breakouts all day long with your teachers. And we want you to go and do that. Tonight, I think at 10 o'clock, Marketplace opens, and we want you to go and spend your money there. Yeah. Uh, not you. Not, not you. you. Damn. You said everybody. Everybody. Hey, Did I say everybody? not to leave. No, don't we leave. Have a, we have a surprise at the end. Sometimes. We have a surprise at the end. I don't know what it is, so it's a, really a surprise. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, oh, I need my glasses. Here you go. You want to hold this while I put my glasses on? Can we eat You, you can't eat it. Hey, they didn't start the clock, so we get to be here all night. Unless you're a billy goat, you can eat it. Oh, don't want to take my tag off? I don't know. I do the tag. Don't hang me with this. I got to do the watch. I know. They tell me to take the tag off because of the reflection for the live stream, but I don't know what I'm doing. It's Bill's fault. So anyway, but what we wanted to do. Did she say something? Dress you up, but you can't take you out. I know, right? Amen. Okay. We will, Bill and Beth will counsel later with us. So. Y'all extend your hands this way and pray for us right now. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. But really and truly, what we wanted to do was we just wanted to give our heart to you guys because we want you guys to go home in a way to where you are so fired up and you're so excited that, you know, that you can take this, you can be a witness to the people that you come in contact with and just share the love of Yeshua. And there again, like we were talking about before, bearing fruit, being stewards and servants in his kingdom. So this is something that River of Life that we've been going through for the last two or three years. And I just want to start out with my little portion. We're going to be about 15 minutes or so each. And, and, um, in Matthew, like I said, you can open your iPhones, uh, but Matthew 22, and Bill touched on this today in 36, and it says, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the Torah? And he said to them, You shall love Yahweh Elohim with all of your heart. Now, the word is all, okay? 
I just, I know that if I tell you, do you love Yahweh with all of your heart, everybody's gonna shout and raise your hand. But I want us to really take inventory. Do we with all of our heart or do we with most of our heart or do we with some of our heart? Because this is important when we get to the end of what I'm saying, that we need to take inventory. And this is what we've been going through with the people in our congregation is really, you know, taking our temperature. Are we really loving him? Because it doesn't say follow some of his commandments. It says follow. If you love me, you follow how many of them? All, All of them. And so, and I'm just telling you, we are a work in progress and I understand that. But we really, if you want the fruit of the Torah to operate in your life, we have to do this right here. So he's telling us because this commandment is to love him with all of the heart, all of the soul, all of the mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. And it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do we really love our neighbor as ourself? And that is something that we need to meditate on because before we can do anything for the Father in the kingdom, this relationship has to be right. And this relationship has to be right. Because if this is, if, if this is, now look, it's not to shame anybody. This is what we need to take inventory on. If you know that there's somebody in your community, somebody or whatever, that this relationship is not right, or if this one's not right, let's fix it. And if we can fix it, then we can start doing what he has us to do in the kingdom. Poke myself right in the eyeball. Man, it's bad getting older where you have to use these to see. You got contacts? No? Oh, wow. He's younger. I know, right? He's full of sap. <laughs> Amen. Well, Moses was full of sap. You can be full of sap. Don't say nothing. Ain't your turn yet. <laughs> That's why I let you go at the end. You can correct everything that I mess up over here. That's why they have me going first. Oh, holy one. <laughs> Here's what it's saying. Verse 40. On these two commandments, hang, hang, hang all the law and the prophets. So he's telling you, that if you're trying to do the law and the prophets and you don't have the loving the Father and loving your neighbors yourself, you're just doing checkoff points. You're just going through here, I'm checking this because loving the Father, loving your neighbors yourself, then can you produce the fruit you need to do because the seed is Yeshua and the seed is really loving him and loving your neighbor. That's how we pass the seed on as we bear fruit. Galatians 5, Paul says this, the fruit of the Spirit. I teach it like this in our congregation. The first three, love, joy, and peace. That's our relationship between us and the Father because Yahweh is love. Only He can give true joy and only He can give shalom. I just want us to understand something. There's a difference between joy and happiness. Because happiness is based on happenings. Because in one more, I mean, you can wake up in the morning and you can be happy. You can say, I have the joy of the Lord, but when something hits you sideways, then all of a sudden you're unhappy. But did it rob your joy? And so this is why the first three, I believe, are the fruit of the Spirit is our relationship between us and the Father. If it's right, He will give you love. He will give you love because He is love. Not a feeling, he is love. He will give you the joy. The joy that passes what? All understanding. Because guess what? We get hit sometimes and we'll say, I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand. But guess what? You can have joy while, because it surpasses all understanding. Because sometimes we don't understand. And so he will give us that joy and he'll give us shalom. Only he can give us the peace that we need to get through. The next three is our relationship between us and our neighbor. Patience. I know, I heard that old boy. That's the truth. Patience. Because if, if we're not patient, we have to be patient. That's loving our neighbor as ourselves. Do we want people to be patient with us? I want my wife to be patient with me. 
You know what I'm saying? So we want to be, we have to be patient with one another. The next one, kindness, we have to be kind to one another. The next one after that is goodness. So you can see our relationship between us and our neighbor is patient, kindness, and goodness. The last three is between me, myself, and I. I have to be faithful. I have to be gentle, and I have to be in self-control. Any of these areas that we're lacking, because this is the fruit of the Spirit, and the very seed of that fruit of the Holy Spirit is Yeshua himself that we give to one another. So we have to be in gentle, we have to have self-control, and we need to be faithful. And it says, for if we live by the Spirit, have we been talking about journey this week? This weekend, journey, listen to this. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step. That's journey and that's walking. We need to keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So you can see here that this is how our relationship, and I just want to encourage you to really think about your relationship. Are you following, are you loving Yahweh with all of your heart? Or is just some of your heart or just most of your heart and your soul and your mind? How about do we really love our neighbor as ourselves? And then I'm going to end with this on my portion. A turtle. Everybody know what a turtle is? <laughs> <laughs> I've been sugar free for about a year. I don't need to hear nothing about no sugar. You're going to call me to lose self control right off the bat. <laughs> Isn't that the way it works? Get me. I know. I'm not going to say that here. A turtle. Think about this. I wrote this down because I learned this a long time ago about being faithful and having faith. A turtle cannot cross the road unless he sticks his neck out. You hear what I'm saying? A turtle cannot cross the road unless he sticks his neck out. That is spiritually deep. <laughs> Bless God. Selah. That's it. <laughs> so if we're going to cross this road in this journey, we got to learn to get out of our shell. We've got to learn that when things come our way that we, we're, we can't move in life. We have to learn to, sticking our neck out and being vulnerable is not easy. But that's what really faith looks like. Whether we're crossing one lane of a road or we're crossing a six lane road. If he's called us to go to the other side, he will protect us in that journey to get across that road. And he will not allow anything to happen to us on that journey. So just remember, we're all turtles. Let's get moving in the right direction. Amen. Amen. I am not responsible for any words other than my own. Because <coughs> you never know what this man's going to say. All right. So I wanted to share something that's probably very familiar with a lot of you being in the Hebraic roots, but I wanna share some things from the Psalms, and that is, and there may be some young people in here that may not know this, but there's 15 of those Psalms that are known as the Psalms of Ascents, plural, or Songs of Ascents. And the 15 Psalms run from Psalm 120 to 134. And these were sung by those who journeyed together. And this is why I wanted to bring it out to Jerusalem to keep the feast. Halisa always talks about the foot festivals. We are pilgrimage. We take pilgrimage when we go to the feast. These Psalms were also recited on the, by the Levites on the 15 Southern steps of the temple. They would get on the first step and sing, and, uh, sing Psalm 120, the second step, Psalm 122. And when you read these Psalms, knowing that they were journeying and traveling the distances to get to Jerusalem to keep these feasts, they encountered a lot of rough terrain. Anybody that's been to Israel knows that just though years and years ago, we're talking ancient Israel, it's far more rough than it is even today. And then they also had robbers and bandits that would also could attack them. 
So they would never, ever go alone to the feast, keep the feast alone. They're gonna journey there together. They're gonna worship the king there together. So you, you can see the concepts all from beginning to end about this journey being together. So just an interesting side note, because I'm one that think that just am fascinated with the significance of the numbers that the Father gives. And the fact that there's 15 of them, that's the number for rest. And I just feel like that every time we say these Psalms, every time we keep the feast, we are declaring a prophetic portent of the rest that we're gonna ultimately have when we're with the Messiah in the land, amen? amen. They traveled in caravans because it was much safer that way. And now I wanna read two of these Psalms to tie in what the teachers have consistently been talking about this week. And that is we need to journey together through the difficult times. We need to be there for one another in the joyful times because we were never, ever, ever designed to walk it alone. And I often share in our community, and I may have even shared it here before, but you know, if there's one single thing from our body, if it's a fingernail or a strand of hair, once it's disconnected from this body, it never grows another millimeter, centimeter, inch. It stops growing at that point. Yes, because you had a lot of them fall out now, haven't you? Yes, uh, okay. So, we're going through the great falling away. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, it's, I feel like the, you know, the scripture says that all things that pertain to life and godliness, we can see in the word. And Brad used to say it's about a house, a land, and a family. So, all of creation declares the glory of Yahweh, it declares his patterns, it declares his principles. So we can look at our physical body and know that not one single thing that is on this body would continue to live separated from this body. And that's exactly true of the body of Messiah. We must be connected to one another. There's the concept of living stones being fitly joined together. So we, I think the more and more that we realize that we're not to be islands to ourselves as we've heard taught this week, that we will get a more clear mindset of becoming connected and staying connected, whether we're near or far to people, that we understand that we're on this journey together. So I wanna read from Psalm 121 and listen to the words that they would be singing as they are traveling together to the feast. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Yahweh is your keeper. Yahweh is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. Yahweh will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. Yahweh will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. These are promises that they would declare and sing together as they journeyed so that it dispelled fear and it brought faith as they continued. Now there's a lot of meat and nugget in here uh, that is very tempting to want to break out into, but I have only 15 minutes as well. Psalm 126. When Yahweh brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. When they said among the nations, Yahweh has done great things for them, Yahweh has does great things for us, and we are glad. Restore our captivity, O Yahweh, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. See, seed is designed to be planted, and I know you all know that. But there was a poor African village 
that uh, missionaries went in to try to help because they didn't have food. They weren't trained in growing the food. So they went over there to train them and teach them how to farm. And when they would give them the seed, they were never getting crops. They weren't growing anything. And when asked, what is going on? And they said, we can't get them to stop eating the seed. They keep eating the seed rather than planting the seed because they weren't willing to wait for the harvest. They wanted to eat right then. And so we, this is, I feel like ties into a lot. We must be willing to go through the difficult time, through the planting, through the time of waiting for the growth to come and then for the fruit to produce so that the harvest can be there. And I believe that's what, see, they went in with seed, but they came out with sheaves because they were willing to wait for the fruit. So I pray that we'll catch the vision as we journey together back to the garden to lay down offenses with one another, to learn to trust first and foremost the Father and His Son Yeshua. We need to lay down suspicions because I feel like that people are getting confused and, and I, I'm not gonna say I'm not guilty of it either, but I think we confuse suspicious with discernment. What is the true gift? Do we have truly discernment or are we just suspicious of everybody and everything? As long as we have that, we're gonna keep a wall up and we're not going to lock arms and walk in lockstep back to the garden that the Father has for us. He said that we have to all come into the unity of the faith and that is not unity of denominations, it's the faith. And he is going to see to it that we get on his page. And by default, we're going to be on the same page on the things that really matter. But we really need to cry out to him for the seven spirits of the Father, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and, and counsel, right? Understanding and counsel, power, knowledge, and fear of him. And if we truly seek that, we're going to be loyal to one another and have each other's back. If we don't have each other's back and we're just out for ourselves, our four and no more, he's gonna take us out because we're the weak link. We need to be strong and we need to be loyal and we need to have the right spirit and let down the offenses. So I wanna close with a saying I love to say all the time and we often end our emails with this. May we... Be the solution, set the example, and stay steady. Amen. Amen. That was very encouraging. She said we should be encouraging. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Soft kitty work. <laughs> Bazinga. <laughs> I don't want to take too much time because I think we still have a, a war path to get on. <laughs> but <laughs> I'd like to encourage you though, uh, we've been going through the Song of Songs in our Torah classes each week. And we're in chapter four now, the Song of Songs. And it, it refers, it's basically a song of resurrection, a love song to Israel. And it describes her, it says, you have a neck like the Tower of David hung with the shields of a thousand warriors. And it's poetic language, it's very pretty language, but until we really got into the word and started doing some work, we didn't really understand what is this Tower of David? I mean, we've seen the Tower of David in Jerusalem, but there's more to it than that because it has to do with what we look like at the resurrection. Now, I don't think you're gonna have a neck that looks exactly like the Tower of David, so don't worry. Because uh, <laughs> you're thinking, mm, gonna have to grow a little, right? High collars. But it has more to do with your spiritual stature. And your spiritual stature is important. I, I talked about the evil eye today from the Torah portion and how doing things to be conspicuous, doing things to be noticed, doing things so that you will be noticed and using the commandments as that tool to be noticed, it's the evil eye, it's greed. 
But on the other hand, there is a reason to be conspicuous. And it is if you are conspicuous for your righteousness, for the, the things that you are doing as a result of your relationship with Yeshua, that is what grows your righteousness. That's what makes you conspicuous in your family. That's what makes you conspicuous among your coworkers. Everywhere you go, you will be more conspicuous. You will be the one that picks up the, the $20 bill at the grocery store and returns it. You will be the one who offers a coworker a ride. You will be the one that is producing this fruit of the spirit that we've been talking about through the entire conference because that relationship that you have with Yeshua is alive. You're not just ticking off commandment boxes. There's no point in that. Instead, it's, the word is alive and you won't be able to help but be conspicuous when you walk in his righteousness and you recognize it's his, not for your own attention, but to draw attention to the Holy One. And being hung with those thousand shields, it represents the promise of a thousand generations. And every generation, he has called out a remnant. And these are the people who will advance the faith. They will protect the faith. They will keep the commandments. And more importantly, whatever they do in their generation, it's laying the foundation for the next one so that there's no empty spots on the tower, so that the tower is completely hung with those thousand shields of those generations promised to Abraham and Sarah. And so it might seem hard to some of you to think about being a foundation for the next generation, but you are. I heard Pastor Mark preach on one time and you know, he mentioned that we're judged as a generation in our generation. He doesn't wait till we cross over. We're all mixed up after that. But he will judge a generation in its generation. And so we're being judged right now, this very moment. We are being judged, not just as a generation, but in this very room. What are we here to do together? And it just seems like each year at Revive, there's a, another level of sifting that we've gone through in terms of sincerity and truth. There's some things he's going to sift out. Doesn't mean it's not wheat, it's still wheat. It's still flour but the flour gets finer and finer and finer. And I'm just grateful to sit here with all this fine wheat. I don't know how I made it through. <laughs> but it's, it is, it's wonderful to, to sit here with this generation in this particular room on this particular night and know that you are part of doing what needs to be done in this generation not just to say that we were faithful or we did the best we could to be faithful with what we had, but I know that we have multiple generations in this room. And you might say, well, I, I don't, my kids aren't here, my grandkids aren't here. Don't you ever say that. You say they're not here yet. They're coming. Amen. They're coming because you're going to remain faithful. And what you're doing here is you're forming friendships. You're forming relationships. We had the leadership conference. You're making acquaintances, people who can lift up your arms when you have to sit on a rock for a little while. So for those times you need to sit on a rock for a little while, this is why you need to form these relationships within the body. If you don't have a big congregation like River of Life or Jacob's Tent, don't give up. They've made ways for you to, to tap into their Shabbat services. We have this every year where you can come and, and worship with us, but don't underestimate a home fellowship. Don't underestimate your little building with 10 or 15 people. Don't underestimate that because at one point, that's where we were. We were down to 10 or less. And so it doesn't matter how little you are, you just prepare every day. See yourself as part of that shield that's going to be hung for your generation and say, I'm gonna be one of those mighty warriors. I'm gonna be part of that. You don't have to be big to be mighty. Where's the olive branch? Could you stand up? Alan. <laughs> 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 
These are my peeps. Thank you. <laughs> they don't look like a big group of people. Well, maybe in here they do. <laughs> they don't look like a big group of people, but out of that group, we've got somebody ministering to the youth. We have Colonel Farley, and then we have his niece, Noelle Kelleher. She's teaching the children. We have Tim Heron, who went and did some programming at HRN. He's got a series of workbooks for beginners. We've got people, Gabby, you and Brianna, what is yours called? The Four House Outreach? Storehouse, Storehouse Outreach. Each, each month they raise money for a charity. They pick a, a charity for each month and the things that they're doing with the t-shirts and, and the clothing sales and so forth, they're raising money for charity. And you notice, and there's our elder, Jimmy and Kathy, you notice I pretty much knocked out the whole group there and they're all doing something Amen. in their generation. And so you've got us old folks. You've got the younger folks who are getting to be the age we were when we started out and they've got their children and they're bringing them up. And so that's, that's all it takes. It just takes a few people who believe in the same things. And, and through the creation gospel, we get lots of good donations. The proceeds of the workbooks go toward the missions. But we've been able to not just build orphanages, but rebuild orphanages. Orphanages, that's plural. And places in Rwanda, Kenya, India. We've helped the, the girls home in Peru. And most of that is like we were saying, the, the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing, but the provisions were made. When there was a desperate need, the provisions came in. And I think you found that too with your orphanage, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And so now they're, they're starting to connect with one another. And I just think these kids, whether it's the kids in Africa, India, Peru, I think these kids can change the world. Amen. If we will be faithful, if we will be the shield in our generation. So... We say it all the time, don't despise small beginnings. Embrace it and start connecting with people. And if it's like priming a pump. If you take some steps and establish these relationships, then it's just like, go get as many jars as you can. That's how much oil he'll give you. You go out there and you work as hard as you can and he'll meet you there. So thank you for coming, I appreciate it. Well, I definitely sense the theme running through here as the Holy Spirit always does. Um, we did have a really good leadership conference. We started out talking about how being in leadership is not for the faint of heart. It's not for the easily offended or for the quick to quit. Um, and that can apply to everybody in this room. You don't have to be in a leadership position over a congregation you're a leader, somebody's watching you whether you know it or not. So that applies to all of us. Um, I wanted to talk about Mark's cartoon. It's, it's kind of, um, I feel like for me, you could have put that on the cover of the book of this conference. You know, it really started things out appropriately. And if you didn't see it, it was, um, as I think Bill described it, the guy, little cartoon stick guy that's it says God's way and he's going up the straight path um, and then it has, I mean it has um, our way is going up the straight path and then God's way is something very different. So here's my description of that little cartoon. Um, our way is a bug out bag full of everything we'll need for a comfortable journey with hopefully no obstacles along the way, a good idea of where we're headed and an easy map to follow to get there. Wouldn't that be just so wonderful? Absolutely. That's kind of what that picture was trying to represent. I didn't see any speed bumps on that little line. It was, a, you know, it was barely even uphill. The guy was just, you know, having a grand old time like a picnic. But here's God's way. No backpack. <laughs> Uncomfortable and seemingly unsurmountable obstacles. No idea where he's taking us and no map. And we're supposed to find joy in the journey. 
Can you relate? Have you already been walking on that path? Okay, I see some hands going up. <laughs> Yeah, she says like Mario Brothers, which I'm terrible at, so don't ask me. But, but I thought, okay, well, let's, let's talk about the definition of the, the word journey, of the word journey. It's the act of traveling from one place to another. Okay, well, that's pretty simple. So what should we focus on on our journey? And that's when my wheel started turning. Bill talked about today um, the word tove, which means good, it means functioning in our purpose, it means being where we're supposed to be, when we're supposed to be there, doing what we're supposed to do while we're there. Well, that's a longer definition, anyway. So do we focus so much on being prepared for every contingency along the way, um, so much so that our preparation becomes our purpose, okay? Please don't think that I am disrespecting any you know, prepper mindset, anybody who, you know, is into um, being prepared. Um, we need to, a measure of preparation is necessary. I'm talking about balance here. So I'm not saying that a good measure of preparation isn't necessary, but he's able to meet our needs. So I was gonna just relate a little story. Um, back when we were on the road traveling a lot, we would go in our camper and we would be gone for months at a time. And I had to pack in there everything that I possibly could because he drives to get to the destination and he doesn't stop. <laughs> so if it wasn't in the camper when we got there, it wasn't gonna be in the camper. <laughs> so, you know, we're on the road for months. I can only pack so much fresh bread in there. And have you ever tried to bake bread going down the road? <laughs> I don't recommend it. So. We were in Idaho and we had spoken to, uh, Bill had spoken to a home group there. And at the end of the evening, this lady comes up to me and she was just almost crying and she was so apologetic saying, you know, I just, your ministry has helped me so much and I really appreciate y'all being here. I'm just so sorry I don't have anything to, you know, monetarily to give to your ministry. But... She handed me a bag. She said, I did make some things for you to take with you on your journey. And in the bag was um, a loaf of homemade bread, um, um, some bars of homemade soap, and some homemade cookies. And they were, all made, they were put in a little homemade cloth bag. So little did this lady know, I had just prayed that morning for these specific things, knowing that it would be very hard to find such healthy items where we were but Abba knew that I needed that before we ever got there. And he had touched this lady's heart and caused her to make that. So she came up to me almost crying because of what she thought she couldn't give. And I ended up crying because of what she was able to give. So he prepared. Amen. Give him the glory. So we can only do so much in preparation. And, and Bill knows when we were on the road, I was the one, you can, you can gloat and, and say all of this right now in front of an audience. I was the one, I tried to prepare for every contingency. You know, how many bars of soap are we gonna need per person, you know, per week, you know, for this long trip, you know. Just everything you can think of. I tried to prepare for every little thing, which has probably had something to do with our tires blowing out the time that it did because we were probably a little too heavily laden. <laughs> or maybe it was his cast iron, I don't know. But uh, I'm sure it was more me than anything. But, you know, we, we need to balance our focus, be prepared as we can, but there are some things that we just can't prepare for, and we can drive ourselves crazy trying to figure it out, and he already has it figured out. So the other thing was, do we focus on just reaching our destination? that we become something unpleasant, not beneficial to ourselves or others during the journey. So I don't think that's the right way either. Although keeping our eye on the destination is very important. And we have a reason that we're on a journey. There's a destination that we're trying to reach. Sometimes in our travels on the road, we were so focused on just getting to our next destination on time for him to get there in time to speak that I know y'all are gonna find this hard to believe and y'all have never done this yourselves, but we did get cross with each other and short and grumpy and, you know, it was probably mostly him, but I just ate M&Ms. 
Uh, if I had peanut butter M&Ms, I was usually a pretty happy camper. I know, I'm setting myself up. He I gets thought, the mic I thought, last. I thought we were supposed to be encouraging people. <laughs> She's singing the soft kitty song for Bill right now. <laughs> anyway, it, you know, it was, it's true. I mean, you've gone on a trip with your family and you're excited to go where you're going, but getting there sometimes it's like, you feel like, are we going to hurt each other before we get there? Is it even worth it? Yeah. And so... Consequently, sometimes we arrive not as prepared as we should have been when we got there. We had to really pray through, and I know you've been there yourself. What I believe we should focus on is what the journey itself teaches us. In this, we can better understand the importance of our destination. Why are we going where we're going in the first place? And be better equipped to function in our purpose, to be tove when we arrive. I believe the journey itself is the preparation. We read today how the children of Israel had to plead and sometimes fight to get to use the roads on their journey and they still had to take detours. We've all had to take detours. We thought when the Father called us it was gonna be one way and we've taken so many detours we're just going around in circles it feels like sometimes. You know, back to that no road map and no idea where he's taken us, just trusting him. They had to face and overcome fears we need to put down fears during our journey. Fear of what someone might think about you if you disagree with their perspective, right Mark? Six or nine, right? And fear of what they might say about you or what they might even try to do to you. But I say if we're walking with him, then it's likely that the thing your enemy thinks he's doing to harm you is the very thing Abba has allowed to happen in order you to strengthen you on the journey. Think about that for a minute. The very thing that the enemy thinks he is doing to harm you is likely the very thing that Abba has allowed to happen in order to strengthen you on the journey, which reminded me what the enemy has meant for harm I will use for good. So we should look for the miracles along the way and focus on how the trials have strengthened us. There is strength in the journey. Don't give up when the trials come your way. We're to count it all joy. We, we read that. We know it's hard sometimes when you have no idea why a certain thing is happening or why me or why now. You, there's no way to even understand it, to comprehend what you might be going through, the pain that it's bringing you. He has a purpose. We have to trust him. But when those trials do come, you hold up your arms to him like a toddler to a parent. You know, I think about that sometimes when I'm in a place that I really just need that uh, fatherly touch and you just, you know, just hold your arms up to him and you know how you are with your own children and how we are now with Brielle. If she runs up to us and she's upset about something, she's holding her arms up. We don't even ask what's the problem. We scoop her up. We're gonna fix this. That's right. You know, I think that's how he is with us and he knows just what we need and sometimes just feeling his closeness is all that we need. So another little story right quick. Um, a friend of mine who has a, a new grandson told me a story recently that, very recently that happened. So, and I made some notes here, so I wanted to get it just right and not give too many details. So you know, pardon me for reading more. Um, she has a grandson who could not be consoled after mommy had surgery and, and couldn't nurse for a brief period. And grandma was trying to help all she could, but to no avail. Finally, they called his daddy, who they were trying to allow to sleep before work. Daddy came immediately, and as soon as he walked into the room, baby started calming down, and daddy was able to take him in his arms and make everything okay. He did what only daddy could do. That's how our king is. Our father's the same way. He can do what no one else can do. And so there's another scripture that is one of my favorite parts of the portion today. And that is in Numbers 23, 19 that says, God is not a man that he should be deceitful, not a son of man that he should relent. Would he say and not do or speak and not confirm? And in my Bible uh, from, I guess, last year when I had made some notes, I have written out there on the side in big letters, promises. He keeps his promises. He will keep his promise. He didn't just promise an easy path uh, to get that promise. As we sang today, no one else will do. 
It was just, that to me was beautiful. I just sit there imagining reaching up to that child wanting that parent and nobody else will do. Nobody else can calm or satisfy or fix the issue. And sometimes there's nothing to do but just be there, be near, just the presence. And that's how it is with him. If we can just be in his presence, it can fix so much. We need to stay there. He knows what we need. He knows when we need it. And he knows just how to get it to us no matter where we are on our journey. So my prayer is that we all put effort into finding abundant joy and peace in the journey, thus making it an even more beautiful experience for us as we journey together because you know we're not doing this thing alone. This is a together thing. This is a, an us thing. It's not a me thing. It's not an I thing. It's all of us together. I wouldn't want to do it alone, would you? I need to know what y'all have already been through so it can help me when I get there. So I don't wanna just do, I just don't wanna make it myself. I want to cause others to confess how goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, and be inspired to join the journey. I want them to see, even in the trials, the joy that we can still have and wonder why and come alongside and start learning. And then when we get there, they've also encouraged somebody else to come along on the journey and they make it too. Amen. Amen. She does pack a lot. <laughs> I've gotten better. She says she's getting better. Okay, now I'm just playing. Um, I don't have a whole lot, you know, to add to what's been said. Um, so I guess what I'm going to try to do is some of the things that I was thinking of, just to try to weave it into what you've already heard, just to kind of maybe, hopefully, put an exclamation point on some things. And so you'll have to forgive me in the way my brain works. But I was thinking about this, listening to everybody. When, when I was in high school, my senior year of high school, I was in the, the drama club, and we did uh, the musical Oklahoma. You think so, huh? <laughs> okay. well, I was Will, you know. Anyway, but there's a song in there that was sung by Ado Annie and Will, and, and the song was about all or nothing. So you think, what in the world has that got to do with what we're talking about? Because it occurs to me that with our Father, it's all or nothing. There's no in-between. There's no halfway. We are told to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. And as Mark brought up, it's one thing to say that. It's quite another thing to actually do that. And I, I do think that... Everybody in here would absolutely declare you love him with all of your heart. But then he has a way of creating a circumstance to demonstrate to us, not quite. <laughs> There's still some things in there that we need to work on. You know, it's like that young rich man. And he went to Yeshua and, you know, I've done all of these things that, that Moses wrote of from my youth. I'm, what am I still lacking? He said, you know, if you, if you really want to be tamim, if you want to be perfect, lacking nothing, you need to go sell everything you own and give the proceeds to the poor and then come and follow me. And, and you know the story. He went away very distraught because he was a very wealthy man. The point being is that there was, there was still something in his heart and life that had a hold of him whereby he could not follow the Messiah demonstrating that with all the other things that he'd been doing from his youth, we could make the argument that he didn't love God with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his strength. There was still something that hold, had a hold of him. And my point is that I think most all of us, if we are being really honest, as we go on this journey, these situations that we run into, these challenges that we have to face, as Beth pointed out, are sometimes the Father allowing things to touch our lives to, to examine 
our hearts to see what's still in there that needs to be purged from our lives. Those things that we may still be holding on to that may still try to hold us back and keep us and prevent us from loving him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. So he's all or nothing. When he told Avram, Lech Lecha, go to a place that I will show you. I don't want you to leave your country. I don't want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your father's house. In essence, what was he asking him to do? Give it everything. Give it all. Leave everything behind. Give everything to me. And what is he asking you and me to do today? Same thing. To give all. To love with all our being. And so this that you and I and others are part of, this remnant that Alyssa mentioned, it's always a remnant. It's never the masses. It's always that remnant. But he's given his all to us, and he's asking us to reciprocate, to give our all to him. And so that other commandment, the one like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, we're told that if you say you love God who you have not seen, and you can't handle the guy that you have seen, you just can't deal with him, what are you? You're a liar. You're not being honest. And so you and I could probably convince people that we love God with everything within us. But it's gonna be very hard for you and me to convince one another that we love one another the way we are supposed to when we're having to deal with one another day in, day out. You understand what I'm saying? You're right here. I'm right here, and he's putting us together, and he's putting us in situations to basically expose whether or not it is in us to love our neighbor as ourselves. But if we're supposed to love him with everything, we're supposed to love one another with everything. And if we're gonna be able to do that, well, I'll put it this way. I can't love you the way I'm supposed to if I'm full of myself. And so I need to be emptied of self so that I can be filled with his spirit and presence so that I can love you the way I'm supposed to. I don't think I can do it in and of myself. I don't think Bill's capable of doing it in and of myself, in my own strength. I need his strength. I need his power. I need his spirit. We all do if we're going to be able to walk this out because it's all or nothing. We have to finish the race. We have to finish running the race, this journey that we're on. It doesn't count if we get to within sight of the finish line and quit. That doesn't count. So we have to finish, and we have to finish well. We have to finish the right way. And we have to finish doing what he's called us to do, to love God with all of our heart, to love one another as ourselves. And then all of these other things that we're working on, that we're doing, the things we're not doing, that we're not supposed to, all those things have something to hang on. Amen? Amen. When you read in, in the book of Acts particularly that when the, the followers of the Messiah were in one place, in one accord, one heart, one soul, tremendous things happened. When they were all one, tremendous things happened. So when we are in accord with one another, or if I may Harken back to last night, that threefold cord. Bound together, fused together, whatever the right way to put it is. But when we come together, that threefold cord can't be quickly broken. And so when you and me and him are together, then that cord is not going to be easily broken and unraveled. But the opposite of that accord is what? Discord. Discord unravels. Discord creates faction and division and strife and envy. All of the things that Paul told the Corinthians were signs that you're still acting like little children. In fact, he said, you know, I, I'd like to give you some meat to chew on, but look how you're handling the milk. Because where there's envy, strife, and division, are you not acting carnally? 
And so it occurs to me that when there's discord, when there's disunity, when there are factions and strife, and I'm not saying there's any of that here, I'm just saying this is something the body has always had to contend with because it's one of those commandments we're told you have to have this one in its right place. And it only makes sense that the adversary is gonna do everything in his power to get us to miss the mark on that one because if we miss the mark on that one, we've failed to keep the other one as well. So then when there is discord, there is all this other stuff that speaks to we're still behaving like children, we're still being carnal, which going on what Paul said, kind of makes me think there's some things the Father wants to do, he wants to give, but he's waiting until we get out of the habit of being in discord and we get in one accord, one heart, one soul, one mind. Amen? Amen. That's how we're gonna have to do this journey. And I believe that a lot of the things that we go through, a lot of the challenges and things, I won't say this is the exclusive purpose for those things, but I think a lot of it is to show us just how much self there's still there that needs to be dealt with and how much we need to overcome of self so that we can quit being selfish and start being selfless. Have you ever heard that saying that the crisis makes the man? I disagree. Crisis reveals the man or the woman. When we're getting pressed and squeezed, all that crisis that we're going through, it brings all that stuff to the surface. Not all of that is necessarily bad though. Because some of the things that bubble up is what Beth was just kind of describing. That, that child, that son or that daughter who, coming to their father with tears in their eyes perhaps, reaching out saying, help me. I need you. And no one else would do. I'll, I'll kind of finish my thoughts with this. Our Father knows what we need. Not just what we want, He knows what we need. And sometimes what He determines we need, we don't want. Would you agree? Sometimes the things that He has determined that we need, we don't want. Those hardships, those trials, those tests, those, those disappointments, all those things. But as Beth said, it, those are the things that can, if we let him have his way, those are the things that can strengthen us on this journey and prepare us for where he's taking us, where he's bringing us. So there's a lot of this journey. Yes, rejoicing, glad, singing, celebration, but a lot of this journey, you walk it out with tears in your eyes. However, those that sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. So, was that a nice segue? <laughs> Brandon, I was gonna tell you this at the beginning, you or Cody somewhere, I need a boom stand. He's out in the hall, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna do something here, I wanna Pitch it back down to, to, to Mark for just a second, all right, or, or you guys. But I want you to remember that. A lot of this journey is, yes, gonna be joyful, it's gonna be rejoicing, but we're gonna walk out a lot of this journey with tears in our eyes. And not all of those tears are bad tears. But he keeps track of those tears. He keeps watch on those people as they're walking these things out, as they're being challenged with life. That, that congregation in Philadelphia, he was observing the fact that they have a little strength because obviously they had been going through tests and trials and he's been observing all of this. Apparently up until that point, he hadn't said anything to them. But when he did step in and say something, he says, you know, I've watched you, I've seen you, you have a little strength, but through all of that, you've kept my word. You haven't denied my name. And because you have kept my command, not suggestion, but command to persevere, here's what I'm gonna do. 
There's a time that's coming upon this world that's gonna test everybody in the earth, but I'm gonna keep you during that time. I'm gonna guard you during that time. And you know what? I'm gonna make you pillars in the house of my God. I'm gonna put you in places that there's, you're gonna be conspicuous and you're gonna stand out, but not for the wrong reasons, but for all the right reasons. So then, we may sow in tears, but we reap in joyful shouting. And so keep our focus on the author and the finisher of our faith. Stay the course. Let's keep going together on this journey. Amen? Amen. Amen. So just a reminder, as he's, this song that he's going to do is from Psalm 126 that I read earlier. And just remember that he who goes to and fro weeping, carrying his bag of seed shall indeed, this is a promise, come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. To bring the harvest, be the fruitful people, don't eat the seed, plant the seed so it can bear the fruit that we are designed to do. So picture ourselves carrying our bags for a little bit and then in due time, we have those sheaves that we're taking in as our offering to our King. Amen. Amen. time. And this is the song that came to me and it's just been something that's been very important to me through the years. But it goes like this. They that sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting singing as they come a song of the Lord and he
we out of time? Nope. No. Don't ask me to sing. <laughs> No, we're not out of time. No, we 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 got to. We're early. Mark Y'all want to do another song? Want to do another song? Oh, yeah. Alyssa wants to dance. We got to get on the same beat here, y'all. Yes, we need to be in unity here. You're the one driving this car. Let's go. All right. How do I tune this stupid guitar? is rather awkward. <laughs> the most the most famous and most performed song in the whole world. Wait, 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 wait. That's all right. No. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. You're messing me up. No, 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 no. You know how you are about tambourines? No, man, don't, please. I can't, I'm not that, I'm not that good. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hey! 